Good evening. Tonight's film is The Conformist. Understanding the nature of the political environment in which The Conformist takes place requires a little bit of, well, a lecture on Italy and the rise of Mussolini and the fascist to power. <clears throat> the new state of Italy was far from vibrant, uh, far from whole when it entered uh, World War I, the Great War. And as such, by vacillating on which side to take, it ended up in a precarious position at best. By the end of the war, the Italian economy was in shambles. Nearly half a million of their own soldiers dead. A debt so heavy that they found themselves dependent upon the Western Allies, who themselves were in he heavily in debt. Using a parliamentary system of government, all of the coalitions that they tried to form to keep a vibrant government going continued to fall apart. So that by the end of 1919, just one year after the war, Italy was looking at civil strife. Add to that the Versailles Treaty, where Italy finds itself left out, rising unemployment, and the growth of populist and communist movements led to corporations, the papacy, and conservatives within the Italian government to look for an answer. That answer came from Benito Mussolini. Benito Mussolini was born in 1886 excuse me, in the rough hill country of north central Italy. His mother was a very devout Catholic school teacher. His father, an atheist, anarchist, whose favorite thing to do on election day was to go smash all the ballot boxes. Benito himself was a bit of a troublemaker, had a bad habit of sticking his knife into his classmates. As a young adult, he fled to Switzerland to avoid being in the Italian army and in Switzerland was arrested for advocating violence against the state. He returned to Italy in 1904 and served his time in the army in exchange for a pardon. He became the editor of several newspapers in which he advocated assassination and resistance to war with Turkey. He called the national flag strozzopina, that is toilet paper, a rag fit to be planted on a shit heap. When World War I broke out, he first advocates neutrality and then, after the French bribe him, he uses his newspaper to call for Italy to get involved on the Italian side. I'm sorry, the Allied side. He got his start in politics in 1917 with the help of a 100-pound weekly wage from MI5, that is the British intelligence agency. Uh, Lord Hoare, probably not with King George's wishes, was bribing as many people as he could to set up what we would call today fascist-style regimes. So at this point, we should probably consider what fascism is, because it shows up in the film over and over again. Fascism is a system of reactionary, that is extreme right-wing, government with centralized authority under a dictator. It usually involves a cult of personality, usually involves terror, often against their own people, censorship, intense nationalism, and quite a bit of racism. Mussolini comes to power as an army veteran as a pretty good public speaker by taking over small groups of veterans organizations. He sets up his fascist party named after the Italian fascists, which is a bundle of rods surrounding an axe. You see it on the U.S. dime on the back side. Uh, it's a symbol of strength in unity. He promised the Pope. He promised the big corporations. He promised the conservative elements in the country that he would restore order if they would just support him. He organized armed gangs called Black Shirts, for the black shirts they wore. In 1921, various different small groups united under his umbrella organization to form the Fascist Party. At a unified party conference that year, he said, either the government will be given to us or we shall seize it by marching on Rome. The government vacillated. King Victor Emmanuel vacillated. Mussolini and his black shirts march on Rome. They arrive there, they announce they're going to forestall a communist revolution, and the king makes Mussolini his prime minister. Under Mussolini, fascism has some characteristics that are unique to the Italian situation. Uh, the nationalism is extreme. Uh, we have Mussolini talking about a new Roman Empire. Uh, you build up the prestige of the state, usually at the expense of in individuals or groups. It's a very totalitarian system of government. Uh, 
complete way of life where the government, or in this case, the party within the government, controls as many aspects of life as possible. Being that they control all aspects of life, it is a one-party state. There is no need for any consensus building because there is a consensus in that everyone is a member of the party. They emphasized autarky, that is, economic self-sufficiently. Uh, self-sufficiency, sorry. Uh, it's vitally important that you develop the country's natural resources and infrastructures and finished products and factories so that they produce everything without any dependence on the outside. A holistic way of dealing with your economy that is often impractical. Mussolini, through his fascist party, also emphasized incredible amount of what we would call sanctification of the military ideal. That is, military strength and military violence was seen as something to be lauded, something to be achieved, something to be praised. But that comes at a price too. And Mussolini himself remarks, peace is absurd. Fascism does not believe in peace. In Mussolini's Italy, all political parties are suppressed. Opponents of the regime are either exiled or murdered. Uh, particularly socialist and communist leaders, because they were the biggest threat to the right-wing fascists, are the ones that are going to be suppressed the hardest, as well as labor leaders, union organizers, and the like. Pacifist priests were exiled, some found garroted in their own uh, homes. The press, strict censorship so that you have to submit your article that you wish to be printed to the fascist party prior to printing. In the schools, education becomes so closely supervised that teachers not only wore uniforms and students not only wore uniforms, but teachers who bucked the party line, found themselves exiled or murdered. You, you may be seeing a theme here. Thus, this makes a culture of, as uh, we would say here in the a and system, corrosive fear problematic in that we aren't going to get education, but we are going to get indoctrination. We're not going to get thinking. We're going to get training. Lastly, the corporate state, as Mussolini put it, uh, this is his phrase, Fascism, he says, should rightly be called corporatism, as it is a merge of state and corporate power. That is, the fascists control the unions, who have the sole right to negotiate with the workers, but the unions are staffed by the corporations. By 1934, there are 22 corporations dealing with a separate sphere of the economy and no others. Highly capitalistic, highly monopolistic, not a big free market approach, but definitely one in which profits are going to matter because the profits help pay for the parts of the fascist program that Mussolini cannot get from the people directly. That is, the corporate profits are turned over to the fascist party to use for what we would say bread and circuses. That is, social security, sports, theaters, facility, cheap tours, holidays to the beach, forced holidays to the beach. In the sphere of religion, Mussolini left it outside the control of the government. He himself had his children baptized. He married their mother in the church. But then he followed up by making swearing in public a crime, what we, a felony level crime. Uh, made Catholicism the official state religion, made religious education mandatory in Italy. Now, it's at this point we can walk into the movie with a pretty good understanding of what is happening in Italy. Our hero, joins the party out of expediency. Why? Because the party is a way to conform, hence the name of the film, con The Conformist. It's a way to hide your aberrations, it's a way to hide your proclivities. Our hero is probably not normal, not by any sense of the word, but by being a member of the party, he normalizes his existence. The movie itself proceeds through the lens of a man who is struggling to be accepted for what he is, and yet unable to accept himself for what he is. That makes it difficult for this man to ever be a true fascist, as you see in the movie, but it also makes it difficult for him to be himself ever. Okay. The, the conformist itself is a pretty good case study in the psychology of fascism. Kariki, is a bureaucrat dehumanized by a dysfunctional middle-class family, childhood sexual trauma. He accepts assignments from Mussolini's fascist secret police, and he's off to execute his former professor. He goes off to Paris with his slightly vapid, petty bourgeois middle-class wife. 
They get to Paris, they live the high life, but Marcelo is being followed by the secret police to ensure that he does the job. So we watch this in the film and we see the dancing, we see the latent lesbianism, we see the homoeroticism. And finally, the job gets done. The professor is murdered, rather brutally, and as well as his wife. This makes us ask, not just about fascism itself, not just about, you know, Marcello, but what kind of ideology creates such a belief system that lets you dehumanize yourself? And fascism is not the only one. It is just one of the ones that we get the most examples from. The film points this up rather beautifully. Stylistically, the film is wonderful, as, as most are uh, by Bertolucci. But the story that unfolds you know, is told in a little bit of back and forth uh, style, you know, like we see if you watch Catch-22, the movie, not reading the book. Uh, it's also if you read, for instance, uh, uh, Schlachthof Funf, that is uh, Slaughterhouse Five by Vonnegut, seeming to be time travel. What it is is we're just, you know, we're engaged in flashbacks. And when you hear these stories, when you read these stories, when you watch these stories, it helps put things into place. In the film, we see this repeated image of looking at legs, looking at legs. That's because it's a big deal. Why? One, legs are sex. Two, legs are forbidden. That is, in fascism, Sex is not about pleasure. Sex is not about engaging with somebody else on a carnal or human level. It's procreation. That's its only purpose. So to even think about sex as something pleasurable in the Italian fascist state is to be engaging in a little bit of revolution against the state. This repetitive focus throughout the film makes the film even more enjoyable because the audience feels connected. The audience feels, aha, this matters, this must matter. This repeated sequence of the leg, or peering through legs, or legs being emphasized, is but one in the entire film that we can talk about. The other thing we want to talk about is the viewpoint of the child. Early on, we see Marcelo as a child, and we see what happens to him from the school kids, and we see what happens to him from the chauffeur. Children matter in the film. Children are promise. Children are future. And yet, at the end, Marcelo's own daughter is dealing with, Mommy, I'm afraid of the dark. Mommy, where is Papa going? It's disturbing. The audience should be uncomfortable with this. Because what is going to happen to Marcelo when he leaves? Now, at the end of the film, we are at the end of the fascist regime. Mussolini has turned over power. A new prime minister is in power. What will happen to Mussolini is what everyone fears will happen to themselves as members of the fascist party. What happened to Mussolini was he spent a few days lamenting the fact that no one liked him anymore. He attempted to escape the Allied army by hiding in a German convoy. Communist partisans, uh, and understand that most of the partisans who helped uh, the Allies free Italy are uh, communist and socialist uh, armed groups stop the convoy, find Mussolini, who hadn't disguised himself very well, still wearing his, you know, general's pants. He and his mistress are locked up a few days later, taken out and shot. But not just shot. They take them out and hang them upside down after shooting them. Being hung upside down by your foot was an old medieval Italian way of expressing, this is the death of a thief. After being shot, the bodies are hung. After being hung, the bodies are cut down. And the crowd, watching all this, vents their anger. Understand that Mussolini has been in power since 1922. So, for 23 years, people, a whole generation of people, have watched this happen, and the fury is incredible. They begin by throwing stones on Mussolini and his mistress. And they follow up by firing weapons into the dead bodies. And they follow up by urinating and defecating on the bodies. And at one point, the crowd gets so out of control with their anger that the police turn the fire hoses on the crowd. What happens to his body uh, is kind of immaterial, but you know it is sort of emblematic. He's shoved into a box, 
fascists who still adhere to his ideology spirit the box away and hide it for many years. He's finally buried, you know, in the late 50s. Everybody in Italy who had been a fascist understood that this was going to possibly happen. They understood that the fury of the Italian crowd, like any mob in any country, can be a terrible thing to behold. This is what they feared. This is what Marcello fears at the end. And as he wanders the streets of Rome, wanders through the Colosseum, he turns his coat. He betrays other fascists. He finds the chauffeur who had sodomized him. He vents his fury on him by turning him over to the crowd. But at the end, he sits with a young homosexual man looking longingly at him. He's still not part of the society, and for 20 some odd years he wasn't part of that one. In the end, Marcello is a man alone, wondering what he really is.